Good morning, everybody. Um, I think most of you have seen us around for quite a long while, but you probably don't know very much about our background and where we've come from. I was just talking to um, someone earlier and saying, you know, after 50 years of married life and a lifetime of loving God, um, it's... It's difficult to know what to include and what not to include, so bear with us, please, and we'll do the best we can. I'm going to start off by talking about my early life. I was brought up in a Christian home. I, uh, my father was a Baptist church treasurer. My mother was a deacon at the church. I led the youth group. Um, uh, in when I was 17, I was sent over to Bern in Switzerland to the World Baptist Youth Conference as the East Midlands delegate from the Baptist Church. Um, and there I experienced some amazing praise and worship. They had already understood baptism in the Holy Spirit. To me, it meant nothing at all, and it was weird, and it was odd. And I came back from there, and I went away to university. And uh, that was the first time in my life that I'd had the freedom to do what I wanted to do because we'd always gone to church. Our life had evolved around church all the while. And it's as Elspeth was saying on Sunday, there is a difference between the knowledge of God and a relationship with God. And I had no relationship with God at all. I knew about him. And at the end of the first year at university, university and I parted company. And I came home to a distraught father um, and had to pick up the pieces. I knew I wanted to be a teacher. And God intervened through our next door neighbor who was best friends with the principal of Southland's training college to enable me to start the next day, literally, at the training college to train to be a teacher. And while I was down there at Southland's, which is Wimbledon Parkside, um, I joined a church, Putney Baptist Church, began to pick up my relationship with God. The vicar, or the, the, not the vicar, the, the leader of the church was a Reverend Morris Kendrick. And I'm sure the name will be familiar with everybody. And his son, Graham Kendrick, um, and Peter Kendrick, who also was, uh, worked for God, um, they were my contemporaries, if you like, and we had a fantastic time. So over to you, Hat. Well, I was brought up in a Methodist church, and I never heard the gospel all through my upbringing. And um, my brother was by this time commuting from Huntingdon, where we lived, to Cambridge to go to the college in Cambridge. And he said, um, Billy Graham, I've got a, um, a Billy Graham relay meeting going on in Cambridge. Would you like to come? So I turned up for it on the coach and I gave my life to the Lord. I don't know why I went forward. I just heard God for the first time. And what was really um, fundamental for me was that I enrolled on the Billy Graham um, Bible study fellowship notes. And that really led me into a understanding of what it is to have a personal relationship with Jesus, which I hadn't had before. Very soon after that, I was off to university in London and started a Christian union and was one of these mad young people seeking the baptism in the Holy Spirit, having read some amazing, scary books on the baptism in the Holy Spirit and really trying to find God in a whole new, meaningful way. It was about this time of um, um, moving into my graduation that I met Barbara, who was um, going to the church down the road at Putney. I was at East Hill Baptist Church in Wandsworth. And within a, six months, we met up and got married. It was all very, very quick. And at the wedding, um, we weren't able to um, have one of Barbara's relatives to come because of illness. So after the wedding, some months later, we went down to Farnborough in Hampshire to visit this family. And they took us along to their church, which was a small Baptist church in Farnborough. And it was absolutely amazing. It was moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. People were prophesying. There was tongues. There was amazing worship. And they said to us, don't start looking for a house until you've found the right church. Well, to cut a long story, 
Long story short, um, I mean, my, my background was in Huntingdon. Uh, we were living in London. We moved to Farnborough in Hampshire. And we found that wonderful church that we grew in um, for some years. Um, during that time, during that time <laughs> um, Howard became a trustee of the church. He was responsible for um, buying a building and um, moving into what had been the Odeon Cinema in Aldershot and became a, an amazing, large, thriving church. We led small groups right from the start. And um, we kept moving on for, to a bigger house nearer the station every couple of years. It sounds stupid, but that was the way life took us. Um, and we got to, we were living in a name it and claim it sort of a era of time, you know? So you saw something, you prayed about it, you claimed it, and lo and behold, it happened, except that this time it didn't happen. And we were unable to sell one of the houses that we were moving on from. We'd already moved into the new one. Uh, we had a bridging loan and a mortgage. I wasn't working because I'd got little tiny toddlers at the time. And... We were desperate. We had no money. We couldn't live like that. And we didn't know what to do. So we called the elders, a very scriptural thing to do, called the elders in and they came and they prayed in the old house that it would sell and that very morning it sold. And we were able to move on. Friends lent us money. We pledged to give it back to them because it's God's money. And if they've got it free to give to us, we needed to give it back so they could give it on to someone else. And within a couple of years, we had recovered completely. But during that time, Howard suffered very much with fears. He had this terrible fear of traffic going past the house, um, making the house unstable. And it got worse and worse and worse, and he went into depression and almost into a breakdown. He couldn't cope with the traffic noise that was going past. And one particular Friday was very bad. And at that point, it was the first time ever that both our children had gone for sleepovers for the weekend. And we had the house to ourselves. I didn't think Howard would return. I thought he'd either throw himself in front of the train or he would throw himself off Waterloo Bridge. It was that bad. Um, but he came home that evening and we had called the elders and they weren't able to come till Saturday morning. And we spent Friday night praying. And it was a time before anybody talked about counselling. Nobody had mentioned things like that at all. And rebuking spirits and casting out things and, you know. And we spent the whole evening just praying and praising God. And by the end of the evening, Howard was healed. It was fantastic. And we called the elders and we said, please come still tomorrow morning, but we're going to have a praise party instead. And that's exactly what happened. So there were some scriptures that um, really came to mind at that time. 1 John 4.4 4 was prevalent, and I think it's on your notes. Greater is he that's in us, in me, than he that's in the world. That's the, the one thing I had to rely upon. Regardless of my fears, God was greater in me than my fears. 2 Timothy 1.7 again, was so important to me. But God hadn't given me, hadn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. To have a sound mind was so important to me. Romans 8.31, if God is for us, who can be against us? And John 8.36, if the Son sets you free, then you will indeed be free. However, um, life doesn't just settle down. In, um, towards the end of the 1980s, everything changed, and I found myself moving from Hampshire, well, certainly working in the West End of London, being moved to head office in Norwich uh, for a brand new job. And some of those fears came back of moving into the unknown, and I can remember the elders, again, prophesying over me that that spirit of fear was broken, that I now had the power and authority to rule over the situations. So be bold and be strong. But that wasn't the only challenge. Within three years of us moving to Norwich, um, um, there was a huge uh, recession um, 
um, in the UK and particularly focused on the property world and property values were in free fall. And um, my, my firm, Norwich Union, were going to cull 75% of their staff within the property area. And there were various interviews and, and, and real fears going on about, my, about our job. And the, the thought that came to me, and it was something I shared in the Christian Union at Norwich Union, was this Matthew 6.33, that we had to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. In other words, don't focus on the issue, but have a kingdom perspective. And I can remember that... Um, I don't think I really understood what it meant at the time, but certainly to seek first the kingdom. And I, I, I did what you should do in these situations where your job is under threat and your security is under threat. I, I went to talk to some friends, and one of my friends had a picture of me as a hot air balloon. But they could see that, my, um, that the balloon was tethered to the ground with ropes, so it wouldn't rise up and be free. And my friend said, God is cutting the ropes. Howard, you've had security in your job. You've had security in finance. You've had security in your brilliant church back in Hampshire. And God is cutting you off from all those ropes so that you will trust in me and have security in me. And so that, um, that really was what happened. I lost my job. It was horrendous. Um, but um, within a month or two, I went to a leaders' conference, church leaders' conference back at my old church, and I heard God speak to me. Now, you might say, we're always hearing God speak to us, but no, I heard God almost like an audible voice speak to me in a way I'd never heard before, and it's the voice I've always sought from there on in. And the voice said to me, Howard, you've already got your new job. So I went home, and for the next six months, I went round telling everybody, I've got a new job. And they said, where is your job? I don't know, but I've got a new job. I, this was a gift of faith because I had heard the word of the Lord. And um, after six months, I got my job. It was absolutely incredible because it was a better job than I had before. And although I was based in Norwich, where there was no prospects of of doing the job I had, which was a property fund asset manager, I ended up working for a top Swiss bank back in the city of London. And that job was promised to me f just for one year. I took it for a year, just in faith. But it then I then understood that it was a seven-year program of owning property. So we went for, for a total of eight years. And do you know, I was in that job for 16 years. That was a double blessing that God gave me. It was my job, and God had said, we won't be giving, I won't, you won't give up that job until I tell you to. So during this time, we relied very much on scripture and God's word, and 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. We're not exempt from trouble, but there's a difference between concern and worry. Concern involves a legitimate threat and is specific, addresses the problem, looks for God, to God for the answer. Worry draws us away from God. And so, you know, there's so many scriptures, be anxious for nothing and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Uh, it says, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. And obviously, during this time, finance became the big concern. Howard had no job. We had two children who were in private school at the time. I had a job, but it was a basic teaching job. I went for a deputy headship. I'd always got every job I'd ever gone for, ever interviewed for. I didn't get that one. And, you know, you start to begin to wonder, and it's very easy to let worry come in. But it's not right. It's not right. During all this time, we had always believed in the principle of tithing. 
I'm not going to go into the principle of what percentage that is. That's entirely up to you. But we believed in tithing. And even when Howard was out of work, when he got his redundancy pay, we tithed the redundancy pay. This was all a gift from God, therefore it belonged to God. And Malachi 3.10 says, bring the whole tithe into the, well, into the storehouse. Test me in this. I will pour out so much blessing that you won't have room for it. Well, it's, this is a test of your heart. And basically, you've got 10%, if that's what you want to choose, that you are giving to God. But the other 90% isn't yours to just use. You've still got to manage it and steward it according to God's principles. And in Galatians 6, it talks about we reap what we sow. And in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. And these principles we have tried to honor all through our life. We've given things away. We've given cars away. I'm not saying this to brag. But, you know, there was a need. We didn't have the need for the car, so someone else can have it. And, and so it goes on. And I think that it's as we apply this principle that nothing is ours. We don't hold on to it. It's all God's, and we are there to steward it. Yeah. I mean, the one scripture that struck in my mind was from Genesis 26. In the face of famine, Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in that same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him, and he became rich. So, sowing and reaping has been something that we've really felt God has been speaking to us about. Now, in 2002, we went... <laughs> We wanted a, a new challenge. Life had settled down. Life was good. And um, we went to a Spring Harvest Conference in, in the winter at Eastbourne. And it was entitled At Work Together. And this is Barbara's area now, so I'm going to hand over to Barbara. <laughs> Um, we thought we were going to learn how to become Christians in the workplace. That's why we signed up for it. But when we got there, it was nothing to do with that at all. It was actually entitled, Who I Am. Not who am I, because God has created each of us uniquely, and it says in Psalm 139 how he has knitted us together in our mother's womb and how he knows every days of our life and his plans for us. So that when I was actually um, created, if you like, by the sperm and the egg, God caused that sperm and egg to create Barbara. And he made me unique. And all I have to do in, a, in order to live the Christian life and live my life with God is to discover who Barbara was and is. So I, ha I need to discover who I am. And obviously, there's a lot of psychology went into this course as well. So um, self-worth, man's basic needs, significance, all the things that I had learned with my Open University degree when I had done a psychology module. And I taught psychology as well as maths for a time. Um, so... When we sort of look at who I am, in Luke 7.19, as Elspeth was talking about on Sunday, John asks, who are you? And Jesus says, who do people say I am? He didn't say who he was. The reality of Jesus in our midst is what we've got to seek for. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to me, to you? And who am I that, or who I am is important within that. So we learnt that you can't earn God's grace. We're valued for who we are, not for what we do, right? So what do I want to become? Who is this person that God created? God is for me, my father, and anything anyone says cannot dis detract from this. So I am who I am. And because of that, I am blessed. Psalm 139, as I've said, says that we're knitted together. And we can thank God for making us so wonderfully complex. Our doing comes out of our being. So I am confident in who I am. And I don't need to be doing things and achieving in order to feel valued. 
Right, I already have significance and I already make a difference in this world because that significance is in God and not focused on me. And I'm not seeking others' approval. I'm not an approval addict. But our problem is we equate purpose with goal-based achievement. But God is only interested in our heart. So we learned about David. If you think back to David in the Bible, he was created to be the man he was. And in different seasons of life, he was very different behavior-wise. But character-wise, the person he was never changed. The same with Saul, who became Paul. He was created to be a man who was totally focused, totally driven, uh, he did a 360-degree turn halfway through his life, yes, but he never changed. He was still the same created person. It's just the focus of his life changed. Okay, and um, there's uh, a scripture here, 1 Timothy 3, 2 to 5, which relates to being an elder. And I guess um, most of us here today are, are elders in terms of our age. An elder must have self-control, live wisely, be of good reputation, have people around to visit and to share meals, be gentle, forbearing and loving, and able to manage their family and home well. So that's really part of the process. Um, of of, of um, developing our character. There was a book um, that came out as well around this time, a book written by John Ortberg, which many of you will have written, and it's entitled, right. If You Want to Get Out of the Water, If You Want to Walk on Water, Then You Must Get Out of the Boat. And this was an amazing book to read at that time in the early 2000s because we'd, we had already taken risks. We'd gone to Norwich um, because that was an opportunity into going out into the wilderness very much, we felt, going to Norfolk where we didn't know a soul. And um, we felt we would be risk takers if we, if we were willing to obey him. So in 1996, um, um, up until that time, we had been um, commuting. I'd been commuting into London from Norwich, which is a five-hour round-trip commute every day of the week. And in the end, we decided to buy a flat in London, which meant that um, I didn't have this long commute. I could walk to work. Uh, it meant I wouldn't see the children. I wouldn't see Barbara during the week. But we felt, felt it was the right risk to take. At the same time, and we don't really know why Barbara chose to do this, but she did a degree, she did a master's degree in educational management. And then in 2001, Barbara felt that her time uh, working in the school as a teacher was over and that she would, would move on. And I decided that I would attend the Bible college that was attached to the church we were in, uh, rather like doing academy here, if you like. And I was going to spend that year just seeking God to see what the future held for me. Well, unfortunately for me, within two weeks, they signed me up on staff. Um, and I was lecturing in biblical studies. I was lecturing in a sort of a, a getting to know who you were course. I was, I was helping the students in every way and I hated it I am not a lecturer I'm I don't believe I'm a preacher either for that matter but I am a teacher I'm a mentor and I'm a counselor and they're totally different to being a lecturer and I just it was like going into prison every morning when I turned up at the college to start lecturing and I absolutely hated it and so in 2001 um, having done this master's degree, we went down to Southampton to visit friends, thinking that Southampton would be nearer London for Howard to commute from than Norwich was. So therefore, maybe Southampton's where we need to go. There's a good church there. We went to the church on the Sunday, expecting a banner in the sky telling us what to do. But of course, God doesn't work like that, does he? And so all we heard was that it was a favorable year of the Lord. In other words, it's up to you. You do what you want because you, you're in God's favour, which didn't help at all. Um, but we were still left with this dilemma. I was in Norwich. Howard was in London. We were in a church. Kids had left home. What on earth was the purpose of life? And one weekend, Howard brought back a, um, 
a Times Educational Supplement because he said, whatever you do, whatever job you do, needs to match your skill set. So we'll look through this. And in there was an advert for the Teach First program. Now, many of you probably have never heard of that, but it's a program that takes top graduates out of the top universities in this country. And um, it's like doing a gap year, if you like. They pledge to um, help in the schools, in failing London schools at the time, and to help the, the students to actually come into some... Um, future life, if you like. And during that time, they're given qualified teacher status. So I was employed to be the lecturer, the education lecturer, to give them that qualification. I needed a master's degree. That was the only prerequisite, and I'd already done one. So praise God, that's why I did the degree. And during this time, um, we were still very confused. We were now living in London, working in London, both of us. We were traveling to Norwich for church. Um, why? There's more churches than Norwich, you know. And, and we really didn't know what we were supposed to do. And meanwhile, our parents were getting more and more elderly. My mother was in Leicester. Howard's parents were in Huntingdon. And we were traveling up as far as Cambridge and then disappearing off towards Norwich in totally the wrong direction every weekend. So we prayed about it and we reflected on the story of Elijah. Shall I just go there? Um, you may know the story of Elijah that um, he was in a dry place. God told him to go east and that's what we'd done. We'd gone from Hampshire to Norwich. Um, Elijah received a blessing in the east but then was told by God to go to a city and we prayed about it and we felt that city that God was telling us to go to was Cambridge. We didn't know a soul in Cambridge and we had no concept of the property market in Cambridge but we decided that Cambridge was the place to move to. So we we moved to Cambridge. But well, we, could, we, we visited C3. We visited C3, we tested Lying the water <laughs> um, and we loved the church. Um, so in 2005, even though we were still had a family home in Norwich, and from the January 2005, we joined C3. So we had this commute. On a Friday night, we would drive to Norwich and live in our family home for the weekend. On Sunday morning, bright and early, we would drive to Cambridge for C3, and then after the service, we'd drive back into London for our lunch, for the Sunday lunch. And we did this for six or nine months until we were able to buy a property. Mad. But there we are. And there is another, um, going on t with the story of Elijah, a favorite verse, 1, Corinthi 1 Kings 18.9, when Elijah has experienced God and there's this quiet voice of listening to God, um, God says to Elijah, well, what are you doing here? Um, and, and I felt God had been saying to us for some time, what are you doing here? You know, what is our purpose? What is our calling? Um, in other words, we should be somewhere where we are um, serving the Lord, not being intimidated by anything that's going on in the world, but just resting, having peace, and serving the Lord in that way. And there was another reference in Revelation 3, 7, where God said to us, I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut, and God opens doors that no one can shut. And during this time, obviously, we're getting older, and we're heading towards retirement. And a, um, a cousin of Howard said to him many years ago, before you retire, make sure you've got the job you're going to go into because retirement doesn't mean just sitting at home and doing nothing. You need a new job. And so we started praying about retiring, but Howard was very stubborn about this. He had this brilliant job that God had given him, and if God's given you something, you don't just throw it away. You wait till God says, right, now you can leave it. And Howard didn't feel that God was saying this. So we ended up in um, 2007 at Grapevine, as it was called then. And Howard laid a fleece before God. And he said, if somebody in this morning service talks about Jonah, 
quite unlikely, uh, then I will know I've got to retire. So Stuart Bell, bless him, stands up and talks about Jonah. And um, Howard didn't believe it, right? He, he said, it's not the right time. God hasn't told me yet. <laughs> and this went on, and it must have been, a, well, a couple of years later. Um, ironically, we had Priscilla Reed come and preach. And what did she preach on? Jonah. And we then took it that this was, this was the moment. But we got to find the job that we were going to. And it was also the right time. I mean, we did test this. God had promised me this job and that I couldn't let it go until, um, until it was right. I was a round peg in a round hole. The job evolved over those 16 years or so. And I absolutely loved my job. But um, the financial markets were in meltdown in 2009, you may remember. We had a huge financial crisis. And it was obvious to many of us, even my boss said, now is the time to go uh, because there's no future in finance. And there was a scripture that I absolutely love, Ephesians 5, 15 and 16, and it's on your notes, and it says, make the most of every opportunity. So we were looking to, to retire and then serve the Lord. In, in 26, um, well, there were lots of things we did. We went to um, Kenya, a couple of years running with Chris. Um, in 2016, I met up with a guy that some of you will know, Ed Walker, who was a CEO of Hope Into Action. And I was invited onto the board and I'm still a trustee of Hope Into Action, which is the most amazing um, charity. I thoroughly recommend it to you. And there I've been involved in governance and um, systems and organization and management and leadership of that organization for some years. Uh, we dipped our toe into politics. We worked very closely with our MP for a number of years. Um, and we are currently parish councillors. And I, as many of you will know, I'm running an environmental campaign to save Cambridge's countryside at the moment. These are wonderful opportunities for us to engage across the spectrum and meet people that we would never meet if we hadn't got involved in, in these, um, if you like, worldly activities. Um, more recently, Barbara's health, as you know, has been a challenge to us. In 2015, she was diagnosed with polymyalgia rheumatica with severe pains in the upper body. Um, and again, these pains recurred in 2019. She had giant cell arteritis in 2020, which was again extremely painful and debilitating. All these um, um, Diagnosis required massive amounts of steroids. Um, in, 20, in March 2022, she um, had a re retinal occlusion, which meant that um, her sight was extremely limited. And she also had phlebitis in her leg, and that had an operation. And then coming right up to date, severe pains in her arms and chest in March of this year. The polymyalgia rheumatic had come back again. And then the, um, the dreadful news that, in fact, she now has multiple myeloma, which is um, um, the skeleton, the skull, every part of her body has got cancer in it. So we've now embarked on a chemotherapy course. We're allowed to have eight courses of chemotherapy. She's halfway through, um, which will take us through to the end of the year but we are trusting God. There have been some scriptures that have come to us just recently, Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Psalm 9 and Psalm 91 refer to that we are being sheltered by God. He will rescue, he will deliver us. And 1 Peter 5, 8 to 10, it's the God of all grace. God has been so gracious to us. It's like he's allowed us um, to go through these times of testing, but he has always been there for us. Um, um, times of testing have encouraged us to put down our roots deeper and to grow our faith. Um, and currently we are speaking over Barbara in the same way that Ezekiel spoke to the dry bones. Uh, hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord to be healed. So 
Hebrews 12 says, let us lay aside every encumbrance and run the race. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Philippians 3, press on, run the race, get the prize. And Joel says, I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. I feel very well. I don't feel as though I've got this terminal illness. Um, it is incurable what I've got, but God knows, and God has a totally different perspective on it. And so Hebrews 12:12 12, 12 says, Take a new grip with your tired hands, stand firm on your shaky legs, mark out the straight path for your feet. Then those who follow you will not stumble and fail, but will become strong. And Habakkuk 3 talks about, as we've sung this morning, sing out God's praises. At a time when we've blown it, when we're at rock bottom, we will trust God and rejoice in him. And he will make us sure-footed and bring us safely over the mountain. Just very quickly, because I know we're out of time now, but um, one scripture that has been strong in my mind all the way through is Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, which is, Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, don't conform to our culture, but think rationally about yourself. Um, to, to conform is to change the outward appearance of something by fitting it into a mold. And that is our external behavior. But transforming is to change our nature from the inside out, from within. That's our character. That's what will transform us. And uh, Ephesians 4.23 says, be made new in the attitude of your mind. Romans 8.5, set your mind on the things of the Spirit. And again in 1 Corinthians 2.16, we have the mind of Christ because we have the Spirit of Christ. Take every, cap, every thought captive, 2 Corinthians 10.5. Colossians 3, 1 to 2, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. And I think we can go on, we can quote scripture after scripture after scripture. Nothing alters the fact that God is in charge and that, you know, whatever happens, that's where we're putting our faith. And uh, for, um, some of you have heard of Jim Elliot, uh, a martyr in the 1960s. Jim Elliot wrote, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Philippians 3, 7, Whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Amen.